thank you very much for that kind introduction and greetings to everyone who is watching. Uh, I am Professor Jeffrey Long. I am Professor of Religion, Philosophy, and Asian Studies at Elizabethtown College in Pennsylvania. And today I will be sharing with you uh, on the Upanishads, the sacred texts which shaped India and the modern West. This is the topic of a book that I am currently in the midst of writing. And uh, just to give all of you a little bit of background, uh, the Upanishads are, uh, if you don't know, uh, part of the text of the Vedas. The Vedas are, of course, the sacred scriptures of the Hindu tradition. And in fact, they are the world's oldest scripture. If we think in terms of religious traditions that have been practiced continually without interruption since ancient times, uh, the Vedas are very ancient. In fact, they're so ancient that there's some debate about their age. Uh, the Vedas were composed over the course of a very lengthy period of time, many centuries, and the final portion of the Vedas to be composed was the set of texts known as the Upanishads. The Upanishads are particularly important as the foundation of the philosophy of Vedanta. Vedanta is one of the main philosophical traditions of Hinduism, and it has been an inspiration to scholars, philosophers, and spiritual seekers globally. Uh, in fact, many adherents of Vedanta would say it is a universal philosophy, not simply a Hindu school of thought, but a philosophy that can be found, that can be discerned underlying many different traditions. But it receives its earliest articulation, as far as we know, uh, in the Upanishads. So in today's presentation, I want to talk about a bit about the Upanishads themselves, but also about how they've been received and interpreted through the centuries, first by various scholars and schools of thought within India, and then all the way up to the modern Western world as well. So we begin our discussion of the Upanishads in the Vedic period, in the ancient phase of the history of India and the Hindu history of Hinduism overall. Uh, the word Veda is a Sanskrit word. The Vedas are composed in Sanskrit. Sanskrit is an Indo-European language. That is, it is the basis of many contemporary Indian languages, but it has connections with European languages as well. And scholars believe there was some kind of ancient connection uh, across Eurasia uh, among various cultures. And you can see that many of the deities and many of the beliefs of the ancient Celts, the ancient Romans and Greeks, the Norse peoples, uh, there are resonances between those and uh, things that are also found in the Vedas. Many uh, very similar deities, very similar stories about those deities, and so on. So the earliest Vedic texts are, uh, there are four in number. They are the Rig Veda, the Yajur Veda, the Sama Veda, and the Atharva Veda. And again, the dates of composition of these texts are uh, somewhat disputed among scholars, but there is a fairly broad consensus that the collection as we know it today came about sometime between 1500 and 1000 before the Common Era. So the collection as a whole is roughly 3500 to 3000 years old. Though the individual texts, the poems, the mantras, the songs that make up the Vedas, uh, those were passed on orally for uh, some for many centuries before they were all compiled into the collection we have today. So the way these texts have been received and understood in the Hindu tradition is that uh, the various parts of the Vedic literature each has a different significance and a different purpose. So the four Vedas that I just mentioned, uh, they all consist of another four set of, you could say, layers of text, which each, uh, each being composed chronologically during a different era of Indian history. So at the very earliest phase, you have a set of poems and, and ecstatic utterances and songs dedicated to various deities many of whom have some connection with the natural world. These are not, for the most part, the high deities that we tend to associate with the Hindu tradition today, such as Lord Vishnu or Lord Shiva, though they do find some mention in the Vedas. For the most part, the Vedas are concerned with deities like Indra, the god of lightning, or Agni, the god of fire, Yama, the god of death, Surya, the god of the sun, 
Ushas, the goddess of the sunrise, uh, and so on. So you see, they're all connected with natural forces. And so the Vedic literature is divided into an early phase where these songs were sung in a ritual context in order to bring about various, uh, very tangible, this worldly blessings into, into uh, one's life. Things like uh, rain, a good harvest, protection from enemies, and so on. So this is called the Karmakanda, that is the action portion of the Vedas. There's another portion called the meditation port portion, the Upasanakanda. So the focus starts to be more on one's inner life. We start moving from a religiosity focused on the external natural world and more toward the inner self and a process of realization of our true nature and who and what we really are. This culminates in what's called the jnana kanda, that is the knowledge portion uh, of the Veda. So these are different phases of uh, texts that were uh, developed over the course of time. So if we look at them chronologically, we begin with the karmakanda, the action portion, that is the sanhitas, as they are called, that is the poems and songs to which I was just referring, and a set of texts called the brahmanas, that is the priestly texts, the texts of the brahmins. The traditional job of the Brahmins, they are the community uh, within the Hindu tradition who are mainly responsible for preserving this Vedic tradition and performing the rituals that are enjoined in the Karmakanda. So uh, all of the major Hindu life rituals, for example, can be found here, such as uh, the wedding ritual or the funeral ritual or the ritual performed uh, at the naming of a baby. Uh, or the transition to adulthood, that is the Upanayanam, also called the, the sacred thread ceremony. All of these rituals and many more are laid out in these early texts. The Sanhitas contain the songs and the hymns that would be sung in the course of a ritual, and the Brahmanas begin the process of explaining the rituals themselves. It's knowledge that the priest needs in order to perform the ritual correctly. At a somewhat later date, we're not exactly sure when, but another set of Vedic texts was composed called the Aranyakas. Aranyaka means forest texts because uh, at this time the Brahmins began to pass on their knowledge in forest retreats, rather like the one pictured here. Uh, people would go into the forest uh, to an ashram, as we call them today, uh, a place of spiritual retreat, a place away from society where one could focus on the sacred knowledge and the passing on of the sacred knowledge. So in the forest, in the Aranya, the Arañakas were composed and they make up the meditation portion, the Upasanakanda of the Vedas. And then finally, we get the jnana kanda, that is the knowledge portion, the Upanishads. We think the Upanishads were written, the principal Upanishads, during the first millennium before the common era. Now that's a long period, a thousand years. They weren't written all at once. They were passed on orally. And in fact, you can get an idea of their origins just from reading the texts because the Upanishads are made up of dialogues between teachers and students in these forest academies, uh, and the students bring questions about the self, about ultimate reality, about our meaning and purpose in life. They bring these to their teacher, and the teacher then explains the truth as understood from the Vedic perspective. And these dialogues were passed on by word of mouth and eventually took shape as the Upanishads. So that was the final portion of the Veda to be composed. In fact, the word Vedanta that I used earlier to refer to the philosophy of the Upanishads actually means the end of the Veda. And it has a twofold meaning. It means literally the end of the Veda, the part that comes last, but it also means end in the sense of aim or purpose. The idea in the Upanishads is that what appears on the surface to be a religion of ritual and homage to natural forces contains within itself symbolically a deeper meaning, which is about the nature of the self and the nature of our relationship to the world around us, uh, to one another, to the infinite. And this is unpacked in the dialogues that make up the Upanishads. So we see a transition over the course of the Vedic literature. If we, if we go through it chronologically, 
from ritual to cosmology. And uh, a Vedic scholar, Herman Tull, has written about this very nicely in a book called The Vedic Origins of Karma. He says, while the Brahmanas exhibit an overwhelming concern with the ritual world, the Upanishads look outward to the larger cosmos. The Upanishadic thinkers did not, however, abandon the principles that, all the, that are the hallmarks of Brahmanic thought. To look outward from the carefully delimited boundaries of the ritual world, they simply extended the principles that governed the ritual. Well, what does that mean? Well, this requires a little bit of explanation. Um, if you look at the illustration that I have here accompanying uh, this paragraph, this is a depiction of what is called the Purusha, that is the cosmic person, the cosmic being. And you see here the entire universe, various levels of reality, various levels of existence, all residing within the body of a celestial being. In this case, it is Lord Vishnu. And in one of the texts of the Rig Veda, uh, the oldest of the Vedas, we get a description of creation as emerging from the sacrifice of the Purusha, this cosmic being whose body essentially becomes and serves as the material world and other levels of existence as well. In fact, uh, the Rig Veda says only one fourth of the Purusha became the visible material world. The other three-fourths became other realms, other dimensions of existence. And so this primordial ritual in which the deity sacrifices himself for his body to become the cosmos is seen as the prototype of all ritual, that all Vedic ritual performed correctly according to the prescriptions given in the text and with right intention will produce results. It will lead to things happening in the world. So a ritual action, which is called a karma, when performed correctly, yields a desired result. When performed incorrectly, it does not yield the desired result and may even yield a contrary result. Now, I'm sure many listeners are already familiar with the term karma, and you may be thinking, well, I thought karma was a sort of universal law. Whatever good we do, some good will come back to us. Whatever harm we do, some suffering will come back to us. Yes, that's correct. But if we look at the emergence of these ideas in the Vedic literature, we see that the idea of karma as a universal principle comes out of the concept of karma within the ritual context. What happens over the course of the development of Vedic thought is that the ritual increasingly comes to be seen as a kind of model of all of existence, a model of all of reality. The cosmic being is within all of us and the power of creation by which the cosmic being becomes this whole universe is something present within every one of us as well. And so the whole universe becomes in a sense, a ritual or rather the ritual is the model for how the universe works. And just as in a ritual, if you want to achieve a desired result, you have to perform the action correctly in the same way in life. We need to behave skillfully if we want to produce the results that we want. And when we behave unskillfully, we can produce disastrous results. And this is really where the idea of good karma and bad karma emerges in the Vedic literature. By the time we get to the Upanishads, the ritual arena is extended to the entire cosmos. Any volitional action will therefore yield a positive or negative result, depending on the quality of the action performed, and I should add, also depending on the volition itself. Because of, of course, sometimes we do actions with good intentions that produce unintended results that may be bad or problematic. And uh, sometimes we do bad things, uh, but maybe uh, the way it works out ultimately is for the good, even without our intending that. So the Vedic sages were aware of this. They were aware of the complexities of how everything within this universe is interrelated, how it all ultimately forms this one cosmic being uh, re represented in the ideal of the Purusha. But our intentions also matter. And so the energy which we infuse into our actions, if that's positive and benevolent, that will produce a like result.
if it's negative, if it's violent, if it, if it emerges from ignorance or from egotism, that also is going to produce a result. It's going to produce a, a negative result. So these reflections uh, are what we start to see emerging in the Upanishads. Now, an important point that the Upanishads really strive to make is that the results of action, karma, even good action, right? even action well-performed, the results are temporary, and so they cannot give permanent happiness. Right? In the Karmakanda, in the action portion of the Vedas, the idea is put forth that if you want to be happy, if you want to be prosperous and healthy and have a good life, then you need to maintain harmonious relations with the world around you and the, the forces that underlie existence, and the way to do that is through the correct performance of ritual. But in the Upanishads, the idea begins to emerge that no matter how much good karma you do, you still have to keep doing more in order to get the same result. This is because the amount of energy we can ever put into any action is always finite. Therefore, the result is also going to be finite. So as there is nothing we can do, per se, to give us permanent happiness, everlasting happiness, that the, the joy for which the soul longs after lifetimes of struggling and working hard and experiencing the results of action. So the Upanishads suggest there is a higher goal. There is something beyond uh, the mere performance of good works and the, the receipt of the results of those works. There is a higher destiny. So Karmically generated results are basically unsatisfactory by their very nature. And here is a, a quote directly from one of the early Upanishads, from the Mundaka Upanishad. It says, but the 18 forms of sacrifice, that is the rituals described in the Vedas that help fulfill one's desires, are unsteady boats, that is, across the river of birth and death, in which what is called lower action the foolish who delight in that as best go on to old age and death again, that is, they are reborn. Living in the midst of ignorance, wise in their own view, thinking themselves learned, the foolish roam about like blind men led by one who is blind. You've probably heard that phrase, the blind leading the blind in the New Testament as well, but it's first found here in the Upanishads. Living in many kinds of ignorance, childish, they think they have achieved their end since through passion, the doers of works do not know in distress they fall down when their worlds are exhausted. That is, when the karmic effects of their actions are completed and yet their desires are still unsatisfied. The foolish believing stored up merit, punya karma, good karma, the highest thing, proclaim there is nothing better. After winning to heaven's back, well won, they re-enter this world or a lower one again, for even rebirth in a heavenly realm is an impermanent good. Right? One of, one of the rituals of the Vedas, the uh, Agnihotra ritual, the, the fire sacrifice, is intended to ensure that one is reborn in Svargaloka, that is, in the heavens. And the idea of heaven in the Vedas is very similar to what you find in many religious traditions, except heaven does not refer to an eternal or unchanging state of bliss. According to the Vedas, you remain in heaven as long as the effects of your good karmas are still being uh, realized. But once that has been exhausted, you fall back into this world. You're, you're After spending a long time in heaven, you're reborn back in our world. And if you've made some bad decisions along the way, you could even fall into a lower realm. There are hellish realms also. Uh, we see this in the Hindu, Buddhist, and Jain traditions. Again, not eternal damnation, but an experience that lasts as long as your bad karma lasts. And then you come back to this middle realm where we are, uh, which is sort of seen as the, the cosmic default position. So to summarize the, the, this paragraph and, and what this, this discussion is about, uh, the earlier portions of the Vedas offer rituals, they offer prescriptions that are supposed to lead to good results, things that make us happy. But those things are necessarily impermanent and ephemeral because the energy that we put into them, the energy put into performing the ritual or doing a volitional action is always limited. So the result is always finite. Therefore, if we stick within this model of earning good karma and avoiding bad karma, we'll 
have happiness of a sort, but this will not be the ultimate bliss, the ultimate joy that our soul is longing for. Uh, it's just more good stuff. And you have to keep working. And work is a good translation of karma, actually, in order to achieve the results that you want. So the higher ideal that the Upanishad set forth is the idea of moksha, the idea of liberation. The Upanishads posit a higher ideal than that of experiencing the results of one's good actions. The ideal of liberation or complete transcendence of karma and freedom from the process of rebirth. Right? The idea is, yes, there's this process of rebirth. We're experiencing our good and bad karmas all the time. If you want to have a happy life and a better rebirth, do more good karma, avoid bad karma. But according to the Upanishads, that is a merely penultimate good. Right? Even birth in one of the heavens is not the ultimate good, which is freedom from the entire karmic process. So this raises the question, how do we get then this liberation? Uh, is it because of something we do? Well, then it would be the result of karma, right? So then you would be back in the same problem. So how is liberation attained? It's attained through jnana, that is through knowledge, through knowing that the essence of oneself, that is the Atman, and the essence of all existence, Brahman, are one and the same. What does this have to do with liberation? Well, put very briefly, we've been experiencing the cycle of rebirth, according to the Vedas, for you know countless eons, and uh, very similar to what we see in other traditions from India as well. Buddhism and, and Jainism both teach this as well. So the jiva, that is the living being, the living soul, has been going through this process but this entire process is predicated upon a misunderstanding. And that misunderstanding is our belief that we are indeed separate individual beings uh, that are distinct from one another and distinct from the world around us. And this sets up the idea of me and mine, my interests, my experiences, my rewards, what I want to happen to me. And that is different from you and yours. It sets up the possibility of antagonism and disharmony. And it's basically the foundation on which the entire karmic process is based. So to become liberated, according to the Upanishads, this is one prominent thread of interpretation of the Upanishads. We need to realize that that actually is not true. That in fact, there is one infinite being and we are that infinite being. That infinite being is free, that infinite being is beyond karma, beyond rebirth, and by realizing that we are that, really, and not this finite self that we have deludedly believed ourselves to be, through that realization, we become free from the cycle of rebirth. And it's sometimes likened to awakening from a dream. You know, you might have a dream where, uh, you know, you're being chased by a scary bad guy, right? And then you wake up and you're back in your room and everything's fine. And, you know, you're, you're very glad that was a dream. Oh, thank goodness that was just a dream. Right? Now, while you were in the dream, it seemed very real and you were seeing people and objects and you were running, you were having physical sensations, but then suddenly you're in your room and you realize, oh no, that was all in my mind. That was not really real. And so that is seen as a good analogy for awakening to our true nature, to the true nature of the self. And interestingly, if we look to the Buddhist tradition, which emerged around the same time the Upanishads were being composed, uh, awakened is in fact what the word Buddha means, right? In, in the Buddhist tradition, we're, we're trying to become Buddha, we're trying to become awakened. Looking just at the literal meaning of the Sanskrit word, Buddha, awakened, that's also what we're trying to become in the Upanishadic tradition, in the, in the Vedic tradition, to awaken to our true self. So... How is this knowledge taught? How is this passed on? How does one know that any of this is true at all, in fact? Uh, what is the Upanishadic methodology? Well, as mentioned earlier, the texts typically take the form of a dialogue between teacher and student. Sometimes you get a little bit of a story. Uh, so, for example, in the Akatha Upanishad, uh, you have Nachiketa, and he's a young man who goes off to the land of death, uh, of Yama, the Lord of Death. 
and he has a conversation with Yama, and Yama acts as his teacher. Uh, in another one of the Upanishads, in the Chandogya Upanishad, there's a young man named Shweta Ketu, and he comes back home to his father after studying the Vedas, and his father says, uh, have you learned the knowledge through which all things are known? And Shweta Ketu says, no, that does not sound familiar. I don't think that's something my teachers taught. So then his father proceeds to teach him. So you have this series of these teacher and student dialogues. Sometimes the teacher is uh, not a human being. It may be a deity, um, the figure of Satyakama, uh, another figure from the Chandogya Upanishad. Uh, his teachers include all of nature. He learns things from lightning. He learns things from various animals and plants uh, and so on. So uh, in, any, in, in all of these cases, the basic structure is that you have a student inquiring into the nature of reality and a teacher passing on that knowledge. And the teacher is presumed to, to know this directly through experience. At the ultimate basis of knowledge is one's own direct experience. And in the Upanishadic tradition, it, it's believed that you haven't really learned uh, the, the lesson until you actually have apprehended it yourself directly through experience. There's extensive use of poetic metaphors and imagery in the Upanishads. Some Upanishadic teachings can be interpreted non-dualistically. Uh, this is the interpretation that I was just giving, uh, the idea that you are that, right? Tattvamasi in Sanskrit. All this indeed is Brahman, Sarvam Kalvidam Brahma. And others can be interpreted more dualistically. Uh, in the Akatha Upanishad, for example, it says, the self reveals itself to those whom it chooses, which almost sounds like a kind of predestination where you have a divine reality sharing the grace of this knowledge with, uh, with those whom it chooses. And we don't know why uh, it chooses that. So, excuse me, given these different phrases that we find in the Upanishads, we see that the texts themselves have also been interpreted differently by various schools of thought in the Hindu tradition, some in a more non-dualistic way, others in a more dualistic way. Dualism meaning seeing a distinction between Brahman or God, the infinite, and us, the individual soul. So early Vedanta, the philosophy that seems to have emerged right after the time these texts were composed, uh, sometimes scholars call pre-sectarian Vedanta, before the various teachers founded their systems of thought. Uh, according to these early articulations of Vedanta, Brahman, the infinite, has become this whole cosmos. And again, this refers back to the idea of the Purusha, the cosmic person that we met in the Rig Veda. Uh, the systematic summary of the Upanishads can be found uh, in, in a text of this early pre-sectarian school of thought called the Brahma Sutras. Uh, the Brahma Sutras are extremely difficult to understand without the aid of a commentary. They're very terse Sanskrit summarizations of core ideas of the Upanishads. And one of the ways in which the various Vedantic teachers of the later eras proved themselves and established their schools of thought was to provide a commentary, an exposition of the Brahma Sutras. So the Brahma Sutras are very technical knowledge. This is knowledge for people who are completely dedicated to pursuing this philosophy. A more popular summary that can be grasped by the ordinary person is found in a text that many of you, I'm sure, have heard of called the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita is a portion of a very popular story, the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata has formed the basis of what you could call Hindu popular culture uh, for many centuries. Along with another popular story, the Ramayana, it has formed the basis of plays, songs, poems, uh, statuary that you see in temples. Uh, it's uh, even children uh, in India can tell you the basic story of the Mahabharata and the Ramayana and can explain who the various characters are and who their favorite character is and who their, what their favorite episode is and so on. This is very different from the Vedas. The Vedas traditionally were seen as technical knowledge, knowledge that belonged to the Brahmins and would typically only be learned by people who were initiated into that Brahmin tradition. But everybody knows the Mahabharata and everybody knows the Ramayana. And so contained, embedded within the Mahabharata is Again, as in the Upanishads, you have a teacher and student, you have uh, the avatar or manifestation of, of the divine reality named Krishna, 
and he teaches his student, that is his good friend, the warrior Arjuna, who's one of the main characters of the epic. And they're just on the eve of battle. They're about to fight the final climactic battle of the Mahabharata. And Arjuna begins to have doubts about whether this is really the right thing to do. And this prompts a, a lengthy discourse, uh, a kind of Upanishad between Krishna and Arjuna. And so this is an Upanishad that is available to everyone. And in fact, sometimes the Gita is called an Upanishad. It's called the Gita Upanishad uh, by many people because it's seen as having a status equivalent in terms of authority to the Upanishads. It is a summary of the Upanishads. Again, the Brahma Sutra is a systematic technical, very philosophically precise summary of the Upanishads. But the Gita is a summary of the Upanishads that, that anyone can really grasp or understand. The Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras, and the Bhagavad Gita form something called the Prasthanatraya, that is the threefold foundation of Vedanta. And traditionally, the way uh, a teacher, an interpreter of these texts, would become certified as an acharya, that is an authoritative teacher, would be to write commentaries, scholarly, learned uh, discourses, explaining these texts. So I'm going to talk about some of the more prominent Vedantic acharyas, and all of them are known for their commentaries on the Upanishads, the Brahma Sutras, and the Bhagavad Gita. Probably the oldest and one of the best known, uh, certainly in the Western world, is Advaita Vedanta, which was taught by the acharya or teacher Shankara. Uh, it, in turn, is based on a doctrine called Ajativada, which was taught by Shankara's uh, Param Guru, that is his guru's guru, his teacher's teacher, uh, who was named Gaudapada. According to Advaita Vedanta, Brahman alone is real. The cosmos is something called maya, that is, it's an appearance. Sometimes it's translated as an illusion. Uh, maya is translated as illusion. But uh, not all scholars are happy with that translation because uh, maya is not, you could say, some illusion that is additional to or on top of Brahman. Because again, Brahman is the sole reality. Maya is how Brahman is perceived if we do not correctly realize or comprehend Brahman, right? So it's how Brahman appears to us, to our minds that are clouded and deluded by ignorance and, and mistakes, uh, mistaken perceptions. One of the most popular images to explain this is uh, the rope and the snake. Uh, the idea is that uh, if you go into a poorly lit area, maybe a poorly lit room, and there's a rope lying on the ground, uh, but because of the poor lighting, you think it's a snake. And as long as you are perceiving that rope to be a snake, it's a snake for you. Uh, your heart rate might accelerate, your blood pressure might go up, you start to feel the fight or flight instinct. The, it's having all the effects that perceiving an actual snake would have upon you. Then someone comes along, uh, your friend comes in and turns on the light, and lo and behold, it's just a rope. And just like waking up from a dream, a bad dream, and realizing, ah, it was just a dream, realizing, oh, it's just a rope. All my nervousness, all my worry is all gone. So in the same way, the world, the cycle of rebirth, the cycle of karma, the cycle of death and suffering and rebirth that we all experience is only the appearance. The deeper reality of Brahman is that it is infinite bliss, infinite wisdom, and in fact, that is what we truly are, and that alone is real, according to Advaita Vedanta. So Shankara presented this interpretation around the ninth century of the common era. That's when we think he lived, end of the eighth century, start of the ninth century. Uh, and again, uh, he presents us with the metaphor of the snake and the rope, which is really a good way to summarize Advaita Vedanta if you need to. But not all scholars agreed with Shankara's interpretation. Shankara's interpretation was very powerful. Uh, it gained uh, quite a large following uh, right from his lifetime. He defeated a lot of other scholars in debate, uh, including scholars from other traditions, uh, such as Buddhist thinkers, Jain thinkers, and so on. Um, but uh, there were aspects of the Upanishads and aspects of the Vedic tradition that some scholars felt that Advaita Vedanta did not quite capture. So the first of these post-Shankara thinkers is uh, Ramanuja, pictured here. 
And he articulated what he called Vishishta Dvaita Vedanta, which you could translate as non-duality with difference. Sometimes it's translated as qualified non-dualism. And uh, this is the idea, the way Ramanuja presents it, is that Brahman is the organic unity of God, Ishvara, the Supreme Being, and the cosmos, the jagat, the flow of existence, as well as the innumerable souls, the jivas, all of us within it. In other words, there's a tendency to interpret Shankara's Advaita Vedanta as though any difference at all in the universe, the very idea of a universe as distinct from just pure Brahman, is mistaken, right? Well, that's Maya, that's not correct, we need to go beyond that. And uh, many thinkers in India were not entirely satisfied with that idea, uh, particularly uh, from the perspective of Ramanuja and many of the other thinkers I'm about to present after him, uh, to obliterate the distinction between the supreme being and the individual soul, for example, undermines the experience of bhakti or devotion, which is a big part of Hindu spirituality. And it goes all the way back to Vedic religion, that uh, through the love of God and developing a loving relationship with God, one can become free from the cycle of rebirth, one can rise above and transcend this universe and reside forever joyfully in, in a loving union with the divine. Now, a loving union is a unification of what are originally two distinct things, right? Love is a relationship which involves, you know, one being and another being. And so if that's obliterated, if we say, well, it's just all Brahman, then according to thinkers like Ramanuja, that undermines Pakti. Now, Shankara and the Advaita Vedantins didn't agree that they, they saw a very important place for Pakti and spirituality. But for them, that was a step on the way to this higher knowledge or realization. For Ramanuja and many who came after, uh, no, bhakti, the relationship of bhakti, the sweetness of bhakti, this is something you want to uh, reside within forever, right? It's not simply an, an intermediate stage. And the modern Vedantic sage, uh, Sri Ramakrishna, uh, actually he was quoting even an earlier sage when he said this, but he very famously said uh, about this question of bhakti and does bhakti go away when you have the higher realization? He said, I want to taste sugar. I don't want to become sugar, right? And so he was saying you know, that there needs to be some place for duality. And so according to Ramanuja, there is unity at the highest level. Everything forms one reality that is Brahman, but there are differences within that unity. There is God who is kind of like the soul of the cosmos and the cosmos is kind of like the body of God, according to uh, Ramanuja. So this is a different kind of non-duality than what we found with Shankara. The cosmos, again, is something like the body of God. And of course, this has all kinds of ecological implications, which a lot of contemporary thinkers have been unpacking. And if, if the world is not simply material stuff, but is the body of the divine, then we should treat it with reverence and, and with love and with respect as we would the divine. Then uh, a couple centuries after uh, Ramanuja, Ramanuja comes a couple centuries after Shankara, a couple centuries after him, around the 12th or 13th century, we get Madhva, who taught an even sharper kind of dualism than, uh, than Ramanuja. Ramanuja was trying to preserve duality and non-duality because they're both uh, present in the Upanishads. Uh, but Madhva really thought that the non-dualists were undermining the, the devotional uh, tradition, the bhakti tradition. So he emphasizes dvaita, dualism, the duality or difference between Ishvara, the Lord or God, and Ishvara's devotees is real and fundamental, according to Madhva. Uh, there are a bunch of other systems of Vedanta. If you look at books on in Indian philosophy, you'll often see Advaita, Vishishta Advaita, and Dvaita presented as, you know, that's it, right? These are the three main systems. Uh, the, traditionally, there are 10 systems uh, of Vedanta, and in fact, there are uh, even more. Uh, but, you know, you find some of these sort of conventional lists in various texts. Of the other systems beyond sort of the big three that I've mentioned, uh, most of them seek to reconcile in some way the ideas of duality and non-duality. So they're kind of close to Ramanuja in that sense. There's the Dvaita Dvaita Vedanta of Nimbarka. Uh, this means dualism and non-dualism, right? Uh, held jointly. And 
Achintya Bheda Bheda Vedanta of Chaitanya. Uh, Chaitanya, some of you may be familiar with as the founding guru of the Gaudiya Vaishnava tradition. Uh, it's very well known in the West uh, in the form of the organization ISKCON, the International Society of Krishna Consciousness. Though there have been Gaudiya Vaishnavas, you know, even before ISKCON, uh, and there still are today. Uh, Achintya means inconceivable. And Bheda Bheda means something kind of like Advaita with Dvaita, that is, a difference and non-difference. And many scholars have raised the question, well, how do you reconcile these two visions? Either reality is dualistic or it's non-dualistic. And Chaitanya says it's both, and we really can't conceive of it with our finite mind. But it's revealed as such in the Upanishads, so we need to trust in that and in the teaching of the sages. So this is what Chaitanya taught. He lived around the 15th century. So we're getting you know, closer and closer to the present day in time. Uh, if we skip ahead a little bit to the 19th century, uh, in the modern period, Vedanta has again been interpreted in a way that emphasizes the diversity of possible paths to the divine, what we call pluralism, and the importance of direct experience of the divine reality, anubhava, that is experience, or vijnana, that is knowledge that goes beyond conventional knowledge. So the two teachers I have pictured here, uh, on the left you see Sri Ramakrishna and his close disciple, on the right Swami Vivekananda, who was the first Vedantic teacher to come to the Western world and teach Vedanta and, and spread it uh, in the West. So these ideals of pluralism and direct experience have been championed very prominently by Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda. Uh, they really promoted the idea of Vedanta as a universal philosophy. Ramakrishna famously practiced many different types of spiritual path until he would achieve an experience of samadhi, an experience of very profound union with whatever form of the divine he was contemplating. So he practiced the various paths of available within the Hindu tradition, Vaishnava, Shaiva, Shakta paths, and uh, also the non-dual path of Advaita Vedanta. But he didn't stop there. Uh, it's also said that he practiced Islam for a period of time, uh, that he practiced Christianity, or at least a, a, a devotion to Jesus for a period of time. And in all of these, he had these powerful Samadhi experiences so according to his followers, he essentially proved through his experience that many paths can lead to this realization of an ultimate truth, an ultimate reality. And Ramakrishna treated the different philosophies, you know, is it non-dual? Is it dualistic? How should we think of it? He said, these are all correct. These are all different matrices through which we seek to explain and comprehend that which is ultimately beyond comprehension, the infinite reality. For Ramakrishna, the important thing is to experience that reality, how we explain it to ourselves uh, and one another, uh, Sometimes we get into debates about that. Sometimes uh, this leads to conflict. Is that we should not enter into that phase of debate or conflict. We should simply appreciate the multifaceted nature of the infinite. And Swami Vivekananda carried this forward and brought it to the Western world and uh, taught such things as uh, such images as uh, many rivers flowing into the one ocean, many paths up the same mountain, and so on. And really saw this as integral uh, to Vedanta. In the Western world, uh, in addition to Hindu teachers like Ramakrishna and Swami Vivekananda and many since uh, them uh, bringing Upanishadic ideas, uh, there have been some connections between the thought world of the Upanishads and the West actually for a very, very long time. Numerous affinities can be found between the teachings of the Upanishads and those of various Greek philosophers who were contemporary with the composition of the Upanishads, uh, like Parmenides, Heraclitus, Pythagoras, Socrates, Plato, Plotinus. There are many, many ways in which the teachings of these ancient Greek philosophers resemble the ideas of the Upanishads. And there are several ways of thinking about this. Uh, one is that there was actually some contact between these ancient Greek thinkers and the thought world of India. And we know that at least after a certain point, that was certainly the case, uh, that uh, after uh, Alexander invaded the northwestern part of India, and from that point onward, we know there was quite a lot of trade across the Hellenistic world uh, that connected Greece with India. 
Uh, but uh, we also know there was some amount of interaction even earlier than that, right? So some of these figures, Parmenides, Heraclitus, Pythagoras, Socrates, they all precede Alexander. And yet Socrates, for example, uh, uses the metaphor of the chariot for describing the relationship between the self and the body. And a virtually identical meta metaphor is present in the Katha Upanishad. Uh, of course, that raises the question, which direction did the influence flow or was it mutual? Uh, India certainly was the older civilization, and we know that. Uh, and so it, it seems likely that this is more of a case of the Greeks picking up ideas uh, from India. Uh, but there could have been some mutual uh, exchange as well. There, there's a lot that we don't know about this, this period. But we know that the resemblances are there very, very clearly. Uh, we also know that uh, Buddhists, especially from India, uh, took many ideas and uh, actually did come into the Western world. We know there was a Buddhist presence in Alexandria, in Egypt, for example. And many of the concepts of Buddhism are also found in the Upanishads. They're much more connecting them than separating them, really. So you have this thought world expanding beyond just India and really encompassing the ancient Mediterranean world as well. So then via the Greek thinkers, many of these ideas find their way into Western thought. It's likely, again, that there was extensive dialogue between the cultures of ancient India and Greece. And we, we know more and more about that uh, as more texts are discovered and more uh, archaeology is done, and we learn more about the connections uh, between these cultures. If we skip ahead through time a bit, in, in, within Indian history, we see that interest in the Upanishads outside the Hindu tradition uh, and in recent centuries can be traced back to the 17th century Mughal prince Darashiko, who had these texts translated into Persian. This Persian translation became the basis for the first translations of the Upanishads into Latin, French, and then German and English. So Darashika was deeply interested in the Upanishads. He was a devout Muslim. Uh, at the same time, he was not a dogmatic Muslim. And he was very impressed by what he found to be profound spiritual truths and truths about the relations between God and the world that he found in the Upanishads. And in fact, there is an Islamic doctrine of a uh, of a lost scripture, uh, and uh, Durashiko said that he believed he had found it in the Upanishads. And so he had the text translated into Persian, which was the, the language of the royal court of the Mughal Empire. And uh, again, later scholars, when European scholars became more aware of India, uh, you have translations first uh, into Latin, and then based on that Latin translation, you get French, German, and English translations. Now we're getting up into the 18th and 19th centuries. So with the beginning of the study of Indology in the Western world, uh, the first uh, artifact of the Upanishads that becomes available is the Persian translation. Now you might say, why is that? Because we know, for example, that in the 18th century, uh, British scholars had direct interaction with Brahmins who taught them Sanskrit and they learned how to read Sanskrit texts. So why didn't they just read the Upanishads in Sanskrit? Well, again, this is because unlike the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads were part of the Vedas. And the Vedas, again, were traditionally only shared within the Brahmin tradition. In fact, if we look at the word Upanishad itself, um, it literally means something that is whispered to another person. Uh, if you break down the etymology of the word, it means uh, sitting very close by. So the implication is that the teacher is sitting very close to the student and sort of leaning over and whispering a secret. You are that. You are that highest reality. Tattvamasi, Sarvam Kaldivam Brahman. And this uh, idea of, of sitting very close and being nearby implies something secret. It's something you don't just sort of proclaim from the mountaintop. In fact, and uh, people in the Theosophical Society might find this particularly interesting because of its implication of being a secret, uh, a pretty good translation of the term Upanishad is the secret doctrine. Uh, that is uh, really what it means. So uh, Darashiko was able to get it translated into Persian because he was the emperor, right? And this, this was an unusual circumstance. But when other foreign scholars came in, people from Europe, 
uh, the Sanskrit Upanishads were not in the beginning available to them, but the Persian one was. The Persian translation uh, was something that was available to them and that they then used as the basis for their own translations. The first philosopher in the West to really take these texts very seriously uh, was Arthur Schopenhauer. Uh, lived in the late 18th and into the 19th centuries. Uh, he was deeply inspired by the Upanishads, as shown in his famous work, The World as Will and Representation. If you read this text, it is really Schopenhauer's attempt to translate the concepts of Vedanta, the concepts of the Upanishads, into a Western idiom uh, in a way that could be understood and appreciated in the West. And he found it entirely persuasive, uh, the, the doctrine of the Upanishads, as he understood understood it. Now, his interpretation of the Upanishads has been critiqued by many. Uh, some have argued that it reflects more of his 19th century German sensibility than an ancient Indian sensibility. But uh, I personally think some of those criticisms are unfair. If you consider that he was working with a German translation of a Latin translation of a Persian translation of the original Sanskrit Upanishads, I think he did a pretty good job, right? Because there's always distortion whenever something is translated translated into another language. Uh, language translation is not simply a matter of substituting one word for another. Uh, the idioms, the grammar, the connotations of words, as well as their literal meaning, all of these things play a role. And uh, a, a translation really is an artifact in a new language. Uh, it's not just a rendering faithfully of what was there in the original, but it is always a, a matter of interpretation. And Schopenhauer was working with what was available to him. And given what was available to him, uh, I would, I would personally say his translations, uh, his, his understanding of it is not far off. Uh, similarly, uh, Schopenhauer's contemporary, uh, now shifting over to America, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, found in the early translations of the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, a philosophy of the presence of divinity in nature, which he found fit well with the sensibility of the relatively young uh, American nation. This line of thought was continued by other transcendentalists, such as Henry David Thoreau and Walt Whitman. And in fact, uh, it continues to be transmitted uh, by spiritual seekers and people in the West who are interested in this philosophy to the present day. These profound texts continue to inspire both spiritual seekers and scholars who use these texts to study the cultural and intellectual history of ancient India, and also as a guide to spiritual life, right? They, they are teachings about the self, teachings about the infinite, the relationship between the self and the infinite. And uh, people have found inspiration in these and continue to write up to the present day. Uh, if you think of the intellectual heirs of Emerson and Thoreau and Whitman, uh, we come to figures like Houston Smith, Joseph Campbell, uh, Aldous Huxley, uh, Christopher Isherwood, and in fact, many of those people, in fact, all, all the four that I just listed had some connection with the living Vedanta tradition brought to America by Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda established the first Vedanta society in 1894 and began to accumulate followers, people who were very drawn to this way of thinking, and uh, even to initiate some into monastic life. Uh, most famously, uh, the Irish woman, Margaret Noble, who became Sister Nivedita. And so Vedanta centers were established across the United States, places like New York, Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, and wherever they were established, they became magnets for thinkers and intellectuals who were drawn to this ancient Upanishadic philosophy. Aldous Huxley characterized it as the perennial philosophy, again, as something universal that you could discern within the teachings of advanced mystics and esoteric practitioners of all religions across the world, and very famously wrote about this in his book, The Perennial Philosophy. Uh, seekers uh, who are drawn to this, this tradition and to these texts, uh, again, uh, encompass multiple generations. The 1960s uh, saw a massive upsurge of interest. And with that massive upsurge, you also get more translations of the Upanishads and more texts going around. Uh, very famously, uh, Swami Prabhavananda and Frederick Manchester uh, co uh, translated uh, a version of the Upanishads, uh, which is published by the Vedanta Press, and people still read it to the present day. 
and uh, other translations that that have emerged include that of uh, Eknath Ishwaran. He uh, passed away not too long ago, but was uh, uh, also an author of translations of the Bhagavad Gita and the Buddhist Dhammapada. So the Upanishads are right there at the center. If you look at any spiritual movement that has taken India as an inspiration, the Upanishads are right there as encapsulating a philosophy of oneness, a philosophy of profound interconnection, and a philosophy based on direct experience of reality through meditation, through spiritual practice. So I want to thank you for uh, listening to my presentation. And I encourage everyone to go out and uh, get a translation of the Upanishads, get several translations so you can compare them, and begin to delve into these wonderful texts uh, that are so rich with meaning that they have transformed uh, Indian society, and they have uh, even worked to transform the modern Western world in terms of our understanding of spirituality and our own interconnection with one another with the cosmos and with all that exists. Thank you very much.